On the single television in the unit, updates on Nora's arrest played on the news. Watching, she saw herself through the eyes of a viewer, a wild child accused of stabbing her mother 50 times. It was unreal and horrifying and maddening. When my best friend Anna died, she said, my mother gave me a way of thinking about grief, S-A-R-A-H. First you go through sadness, then anger, resentment, acceptance, and healing. In jail at the beginning, the anger was what drove me. One morning in those early weeks, a guard came to Nora's cell and told her she had a visitor, a local attorney named Valerie Quarter. Nora had never heard Quarter's name before, but she needed a lawyer. She felt a rush of relief as Quarter introduced herself, and they sat down to talk in a small meeting room. Valerie Quarter opened her own law practice in 1988, when her children were in pre-kindergarten and elementary school. She soon became one of the most sought-after divorce lawyers in Memphis and also handled other kinds of civil suits. Quarter relished a court battle, and she took on a limited number of criminal cases. A copy of the Bill of Rights hung in her laundry room. It's easier for me to wield the sword than sheathe it, she liked to say. Quarter lived in an affluent part of East Memphis, not far from the middle-class neighborhood where the Jackson home sat, on a street of brick and clabbered homes with lawns near a botanic garden. She knew the schools Nora attended and the church Jennifer belonged to. Since the murder, she'd followed news of the investigation. She told Nora that when she heard the TV report of Nora's arrest, it didn't sound right. Why were the police making an arrest without waiting for the DNA results? She said I needed help and she was the person to help me, Nora said. Quarter put it to me this way. Everyone was so willing to believe the worst of Nora. She had no one to stand up for her. Nora decided she wanted Quarter to represent her. She had a pressing question at that first meeting. Could Quarter get her out of jail? After an arrest, a defendant is entitled to a hearing about whether he or she may go free before trial. At this point, everyone is presumed innocent, and years can elapse between an arrest and a trial. Nora's bail hearing before a judge had yet to be scheduled. In most states, judges are supposed to weigh whether an accused person poses a danger if she's released, and whether she can be trusted to return to court. In the United States, these questions of liberty are often converted into a calculation about money. Should the court set bail? And if so, how high? The answers to those questions. Who has to pay bail and how much usually determine who stays in jail and who gets out. Bail is the first domino in a series of decisions affecting guilty pleas and penalties, so it's not an exaggeration to say that whether it's affordable or not can shape the outcome of a criminal case, and even the rest of a defendant's life. Yet the decision is often made in a few minutes or less based on the scant information presented early on at an arraignment hearing. Prosecutors speak first, one more advantage for them. They draw on the facts in the arrest warrant and rap sheet, reducing the defendant to the police account of what he or she did wrong. Amy Wyrick asked Judge Kraft to deny Nora Bale entirely. Tennessee law required the setting of bail unless the prosecution sought the death penalty, so Wyrick's stance was purely symbolic. Wyrick was signaling that Nora should be treated as the worst kind of killer, and that if Judge Kraft set any amount that Nora could pay, he'd face the headlines on his own. Quarter, appearing for Nora, thought she had no chance of winning her client's release she asked Judge Kraft to postpone his decision. From then on, the press ominously described Nora as held without bond, 